Please be seated. There are several announcements in the bulletin. I want to highlight one. Um, actually, two. Some of you brought in blankets. Some of you gave money for blankets. Our blanket drive was a phenomenal success. We delivered, is Connie here? I want to say 80 blankets, is that right? 80? 80 or 81 or 82 blankets we were able to get out in the community. And that's because of you. Thank you so much. That will make a difference in people's lives this winter. So I like to celebrate our, our missions and our giving things we do because sometimes we forget that our little deeds of kindness can make a difference. We also will be doing a celebration of youth. We have, as some of you know, a pretty large group, sometimes as big as 25 middle schoolers who are here each week with Tom and Tom's wonderful helpers. And this year we are putting their sizes and information on a tree so that people who want to can take that ornament and buy a gift for that child. It's kind of like the angel tree that most of us are familiar with, except this is doing it for kids who worship here on Thursday nights. Hanging the Greens is coming up. Please plan to come. The more people that help, the quicker we get to eat soup and the better the sanctuary will look. And don't forget cantata, cantata rehearsals going on every Tuesday at 6.30. And finally, if you are a member of this church, please stick around for what should be a very brief congregational meeting. And that congregational meeting will be even before the cookies. Are there other announcements? Lynn? Morning. Please join me in the gathering prayer. Eternal God, you appointed Jesus Christ to rule over all things and made us servants in your kingdom. Grant us grace to perceive more of your perpetual loving presence and empower us to share your love and to minister to all in need. At the right time, bring us to your eternal realm where we will worship and adore you and participate in your everlasting joy. These things we ask in the name of Jesus, who is the way and the truth and the life. Amen.
today, our call to confession and assurance of pardon come from sequential verses in John 3, verses I hope you know. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Trusting the saving work of Jesus, let us confess our sin together. Sovereign God, according to your word, you are the giver of every good gift and even the skills and strength by which we earn our livings come from you. In addition to all the blessings of this present life, you have promised us an eternity that is wonderful beyond our comprehension. We are thankful, yet we confess that we are not thankful enough. Rather than giving you the praise and gratitude you deserve, we tend to take too much credit for our successes. All too often, we gripe, complain, and blame you when life is difficult. Lord, in addition to the other countless gifts you give to us, please give us the gift of gratitude, the gift of a mature perspective by which we can view each day in light of eternity, and the gift of a faith that trusts you always, especially when we cannot understand how you are working in and for us. Lord, on this Christ the King Sunday, we confess that we sometimes think and act as if we could rule our lives better than you can. Please forgive this foolishness and all our other sins. Lord Jesus, until the blessed day when all your foes are forever vanquished and you rule over a kingdom that is better than anything we can imagine. Rule now in our hearts and homes and let our daily living be a foreshadowing of your coming kingdom. These things we ask in the name of Jesus, the King of Kings, amen. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. In Jesus, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Are you comfortable? Yes, I'm comfortable. That, that's good. That's what I wanted to find out. Now, Jake, um, you know what a nickname is, don't you? Yes. And yours is Jay Bird, right? Okay, pretty much. Your mom calls you, your mother calls you Jay Bird. Yes. Sometimes we call you Jay Bird. Yes, my mama does. Yep. yep, your mama does. And uh, your name is really important. It comes from Corey's best friend, yes. Jay Schaefer, and you know your Uncle Jay. Yes, I, I haven't seen him in a while, though. 
Oh, yeah, I know you haven't. And then his name came from very good friends, and that was Jay Gatsby. And I'm not talking about the book. I'm talking about Jay Gatsby, who was the son of very important folks in our, in our church. So names are very important, and even nicknames. And today, John... And that nickname was first uh, expressing that he was uh, the thunder, the son of thunder. He had kind of a stormy personality. Okay? And sometimes we have stormy personality. Now that's something that we have. John asked three times, um, he asked, uh, well, Jesus asked, or John asked, how many times? He asked three times expressing his love because Peter denied Jesus three times. So Jesus said, well, how much do you love me? Well, you know I love you. And then he asked again, How much do you love me, Peter? Well, you know I love you. And the reason he asked him three times, one more time, was because Peter denied him three times. And so when he came back and was talking, them at his famous breakfast on the beach, he asked him, how much do you love me? And it's important to know that love is so important in our faith. Besides knowing Jesus as our Lord and Savior, love is right there. Okay, sorry to keep you awake. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. And I thank you for this opportunity to be with our church family and our own family. And we pray blessing upon the name of Christ, blessing upon our names, that we might be children of Jesus. Amen. Okay, buddy. See?
tend to make it harder Build steeples out of stone Fill books with explanations of the way But if we'd stop and listen And break a little bread prayer for illumination. Loving God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive your truth with faith. Give us also grace to respond with love, gratitude, and obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. The first scripture reading this morning is from John chapter 21, verses 1 to 14. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we will go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning, of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, but even with so many, the net was not torn. 
Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Picking up where Lynn left off in 2115. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then Jesus said to Peter, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw John, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. God's word for us, God's children. Well, today marks the end of a journey we began 11 months ago, our journey through John. I pray that this journey has been a blessing to all who have taken it. If you didn't really take it, there's still time. John is still in our Bibles, and the sermon series is still on the internet. John can help us like no other book in the world to know Jesus and to love him. There are four Gospels, and all four Gospels are great in their own way. But about 90% of the material in John is found in John only. Because, as Tom said, John is the apostle of love, and he was especially close to Jesus. And as John him records in chapter 14, verse 25, it was by the Holy Spirit causing John to remember the things that Jesus had said that John's gospel comes to us. 
I can't imagine a world in which I would outgrow John's gospel. I can't imagine a world in which it would stop feeding my soul. And I'm pretty sure that's true for everybody who reads it. In today's passage, the final passage of the book, Jesus made a surprise visit to seven of his disciples while they were fishing on the Sea of Galilee. You might wonder, why were those seven disciples fishing for fish instead of fishing for people? Why were they out on the water instead of in a crowd talking about Jesus? Well, for one, Pentecost had not yet happened. And number two, at least four of the disciples, and quite possibly more, were professional fishermen. Fishing is what they did for a living. I think those seven men went fishing because they were hungry or because they needed money and planned to sell some fish. The kind of fishing that the disciples did was not the kind of fishing that most of us probably have done. It wasn't casting a line out and relaxing and watching a bobber. It wasn't even, you know, the, less, the slightly more strenuous, you know, fly fishing that takes a lot of work. The kind of fishing they did was backbreaking, exhausting labor. They took large nets, sometimes 40 to 60 feet across and 20 feet deep, and they laid them out hand over hand as someone else rode the boat, and then they dragged the giant net to shore. This wasn't a one-man job. This was a team operation. It was exhausting. It was hard work. And after an entire night of setting out their nets and drawing their nets back in, after all night of doing that over and over, they had not caught a single fish. Lots of hard work and nothing to show for it. I bet you know what that feels like. I know I do. Sometimes we labor long and hard, but our laborers bear no observable results. Sometimes the fruit of our labors is kind of like a potato. Now, Connie knows I'm not really a gardener. I just pretend to be one on TV. But I'm told that when you grow a potato, you only see a little tiny thing coming up, and the big important thing is down underneath the ground. Sometimes our labors for the Lord are like that. Sometimes we don't see the results, but something big and wonderful is growing where our eyes cannot see. Sometimes we labor long and hard and the lack of perceived results can be discouraging. But here is the good news. When Jesus decided it was time, the disciples pulled in a massive catch of 153 fish. Now there's been all kinds of speculation for the last couple thousand years about why 153 fish. Augustine wrote, you know, many, 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 many pages on why 153 fish. And some of his theories are interesting. Some other theories about 153 fish are pretty far-fetched. Do you know why I think John tells us that there were 153 fish? It's profound. It's because that's how many there were. (laughs) 
So, Jesus caused there to be an enormous catch of fish. Now, we might not realize that actually three fish is a whole bunch in the net, but John tells the story in a way that shows that he himself was surprised that the net didn't break from the size of the catch. And they were big fish. That one net full of 153 fish made the whole night worthwhile. Friends, that bit of history is more than just an anecdote. It is a potent antidote. It's not an anecdote, it's an antidote. It is an antidote for us when we are discouraged with the results of our labor. Sometimes it seems like we work hard and nothing happens. In such times, we can find comfort from remembering that God works in mysterious ways. God works behind the scenes. And God works on God's own time schedule, which is almost always different from ours. When we're working hard and we're not seeing the results, we can remember that an unexpected blessing might be just a few moments away. Verse five might seem a little bit strange. The NIV smooths it out and makes it less strange. But if you read the NIV or numerous other translations, Jesus actually says, not friends, you have not any fish, do you? He says, children. Paideia, it means children. And most translations translate that way. Children, you have no fish, do you? Now, it might seem strange to refer to a group of grown men as children. I know some of your wives are thinking, no, it's not that strange at all. But... It is a little strange to speak to a group of grown men as children, but actually it fits, and we need to understand why. Think back to Matthew chapter 18. Jesus says words we should all remember and strive to live. He says, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like a little child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Children know they are dependent. Children know they have a lot to learn. And most of them enjoy learning. And children understand that they have a lot of growing up to do. Now, we might think, I'm a grown up. I'm independent. I'm self-sufficient. Well, God says we're not. If you ever meet somebody who says, I'm a self-made man, or I'm a self-made woman, chances are they look like a do-it-yourself project. We might think we've got it all figured out, but God says that we have a lot to learn, and when we're born again, born of the Spirit, we're born as babies with a lot of growing up to do. Another odd thing about verse 5 is this. Jesus asks a question. He says, children, you have no fish, do you? Why is that weird? Well, just as Peter expresses three times in the questioning to follow, Jesus knows all, especially after the resurrection. Why would Jesus ask a question? Well, two things. One, the way that the question is written in Greek shows that 
they, Jesus knew the answer. It is, uh, not, without being too technical, the, the way the sentence is written shows that the answer is no. That's why in English we add the haven't you. You have no fish, have you? So that's number one. Number two, God actually asks a surprising number of questions in Scripture. But when God asks a question, and this is true of God the Father or God the Son, when God asks a question, it's not to gain information. God has all the information. Oftentimes, God asks questions to give us an opportunity to come clean, to confess. Think of the Garden of Eden. Other times, God asks questions employing what we sometimes call the Socratic method, asking questions to guide someone into insight and truth. When the risen Lord said, you don't have any fish, do you? I think he was trying to get the disciples to admit to themselves that they had labored hard all night and caught nothing. And admitting their lack, their failure, brings us right back to the name he calls them, children. If we want to receive from the Lord, it's very important that we recognize, remember, and accept that we are needy, we are dependent, we are children. Now that miraculous catch of 153 fish that Jesus provided, it almost certainly reminded Peter, Andrew, James, and John, at least, of that other miraculous catch found in Luke 5 that Jesus provided three years previously when he first called them to follow him. The details are amazing. Both are miraculous catches provided by the instructions of Jesus that occur after a night of nothing. The similarity with that previous miraculous catch is probably what led John to recognize that the stranger on the shore was indeed the Lord. By giving the second miraculous catch of fish, I think Jesus was teaching the disciples that if they simply obeyed his instructions, then at the right time, their labors would bear fruit. At the right time, many, many people would come to salvation through their work. Jesus gave that encouragement to all seven men. But the ending of the chapter shows that the primary purpose of Jesus' visit on that day was to restore the apostle Peter. You remember on the night Jesus was betrayed, Peter denied Jesus. How many times? Three. And how many times does Jesus say, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Three, one affirmation of his love and loyalty for each of the three denials. It is a perfectly symmetrical restoration of a fallen man back to his position of leadership. And it shows us something really, really great. Jesus holds no grudges. I've failed him, and so have you, by the way. He holds no grudges. He forgives us. And, my friends, whenever we fail him, he calls us, saying, follow me. Continue following me. Keep on following me. 
And as we follow him, he works through us to touch the lives of other people. This dialogue between Jesus and Peter teaches us another really important lesson. Jesus was restoring Peter to a position of leadership. And it's really important for us to notice that Jesus did not ask Peter about his leadership skills. Jesus did not ask Peter about his preaching abilities. He did not ask Peter about Peter's theology. He simply said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? When it comes to serving Jesus, loving him is the most important qualification. The first time Jesus asked Peter if Peter loves him, he says three words that he doesn't use the next two times. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? I got to tell you, no matter what language you read that in, it's ambiguous. We cannot know for certain what Jesus means by, do you love me more than these? We don't know what these are. Now, of course, back when it happened, Jesus would have gestured or looked at what these were. John was there. He knows what these were. But he didn't tell us. And I think it's because he wants us to prayerfully ponder it. Do you love me more than these? Jesus could mean, do you love me more than these other six men love me? In other words, Peter, have you learned your lesson that you're not any better than these guys? Think of Matthew 26, where, <clears throat> Jesus, where Peter says, even if all the rest of them fall away, I will never leave you. Did Peter learn humility? Maybe that's the question. Do you need to learn humility? Maybe that's the question. Or Jesus could mean, do you love me more than you love these other six men? Or Jesus could mean, do you love me more than you love these fish? Now, I know some of you thinking, that, that's ridiculous. We can rule that one out. But that's not true. Because as far-fetched as it might seem, when, if Jesus was saying, do you love me more than you love these fish, the fish represent his livelihood and his lifestyle. Peter was a fisherman. It's what he did. It's how he earned his money. It's who he was. We don't know what these Jesus was talking about, but we do know this. Jesus wants you and me to love him more than we love anyone else. And that's a really tall order. That probably makes us uncomfortable. He wants us, he wants to be number one in our hearts and number one in our lives. If you want a text for that, Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, Jesus says, and I quote, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Jesus wants to be number one our lives and he deserves it and Jesus wants us to love him more than our fish Jesus wants us to love him more than our livelihood and lifestyle well what should we do if our love for Jesus is less than it should be What should we do if our love for Jesus is less than it should be? Well, a good first step is to talk with him honestly about it. 
He knows anyway, we're not hiding anything. But talking with Jesus about how we really feel, or if you have me one of those people who says, I can love Jesus, but I can't really love God the Father because he's mean. That Old Testament God, he's mean. Well, that's another sermon. But we can talk directly to God, honestly with God, because we can't hide anything from God anyway. And we can ask God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to help us love God more. And one of the best ways, I think probably the best way for us to increase our love for the Lord is to prayerfully ponder, to think long and hard about what he did for us and what he does for us and what he will do for us. John, later in life, in his first letter says, we love because he first loved us. When we meditate on God's love for us, it increases our love for God. Our love for Jesus also increases when we spend time with him, time with him in his written word, time with him in prayer, time with him in worship, time with him in silence and solitude. I want to close with two quick points, despite the fact this passage has more to teach us. This one is especially important, I think. This isn't a deep point of discipleship like the one, like several of the ones I've made. This is just practical stuff that we need to be reminded of. After Jesus tells Peter that Peter will be crucified, the having your arms stretched out was an ancient euphemism for crucifixion. After Jesus tells Peter that he will be crucified, Peter says, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain until I return. What is that to you? Peter had just been told that he was going to be crucified. And he wanted to know, well, what's going to happen to John? But instead of indulging Peter's curiosity, Jesus gave Peter a rebuke and a charge. He said, if I want him to remain until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. I really believe that we can paraphrase this well by saying, Peter, mind your own business. Focus on your own discipleship. Mind your own business. Focus on your own discipleship. When you hear somebody, maybe a fellow church member, maybe someone else, when you hear someone talking about someone else's decisions, feel free to borrow those words of the Lord. Mind your own business and focus on your own discipleship. The more we employ that phrase, the less gossip there will be. Mind your own business, focus on your own discipleship, words to live by. But sometimes we do have a responsibility to encourage one another. Sometimes we have a responsibility to hold each other accountable to what the Bible says. But that's a dangerous thing, and it's really a thing for mature disciples only. I also think that Jesus is telling us to be very careful about comparing ourselves. That's what this really comes down to, comparison. I'm going to be crucified. Well, what's going to happen to him? Sometimes comparison can lead to compassion. Sometimes comparison can lead to gratitude. 
And when that happens, it's good. But comparison, comparing ourselves with others, often leads to envy and bitterness or to sinful pride. Jesus wants us to be careful about comparison. Final point. Jesus says, you must follow me. Those words aren't for Peter only. They're for each of us. And it's not just a command. It's a wonderful invitation. It's an invitation into a lifestyle of exciting growth. An invitation into a lifestyle where, as branches on the vine, we imbibe his life into us. And we just get better and better. Jesus says, you must follow me. Following Jesus includes obeying him. It includes emulating him, doing our prayerful best to follow his example. And it includes being his apprentice. Learning life from Jesus. Perhaps above all, it, following Jesus means spending time with him. I say this out of love, and I say it to me as much as I say it to you. If you're too busy to spend time with Jesus, your priorities are messed up. It's especially good to remember as we come into the hectic season of celebrating his birth. If you're too busy for Jesus, your priorities are wrong. Spending time with Jesus helps us to cultivate our connection with him. And there's no substitute for reading or, if you don't like to read, listening to the Bible. There's this great thing now. It's called an audio book. Some of you have heard of them. People, it's a great answer for people to say, I don't like to read. Or I don't like to read my Bible. Fine. Buy it for 99 cents and put it on your, on your phone and listen to it. And there's also no substitute for prayer. But please understand, spending time with Jesus, spending time in God's word, and spending time in prayer, it's not something that we add to our to-do list. It's a way that we build our relationship with God, a way that we increase our love for God. And it becomes a circle. The more we spend time with God and God's word and in prayer, the more we love God. And eventually, spending time in scripture and in prayer is nothing like a chore. It's a joy. Please pray with me. Great and gracious, holy God, thank you for loving us. Help us to love you. Help us to love one another. We ask these things in Jesus' name, praying as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right. We have no giving announcement, it looks like. But you know what? We all know what it's about anyway. We give out of gratitude. We give because we have received. We give to help others. And... As Jesus says, in the one saying of Jesus, that's not in the Gospels or Revelation, but recorded in Scripture, it's in the book of Acts, Jesus says, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Let us pray together the prayer of thanksgiving and dedication. Gracious triune God, we present these offerings in gratitude for your goodness. 
and in praise of your holy name. May your light so shine that all creation discerns your dominion, and may all that we do be pleasing in your sight. Through Jesus, our Savior, amen. For the benediction, please remember, if you are a member, please stick around for a very brief congregational meeting. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace today and forever.